loud here. Excellent. So my apologies for inter the interruption there, Jack, and uh, uh, take it away. Thank you very much. Fine. For the video audience, I'll just reintroduce myself. Uh, my name is Jack War. I'm an independent consultant uh, closely associated with a company in Broomfield, Colorado called Absolute Performance, which is an MSP. I do legacy modernization. I work largely in IBM I and IBM Z. I've been programming for over 40 years. I am an IBM QuizKit advocate, which means I participate as a volunteer in their open source quantum computing um, a program. I'm an IBM champion, which means I'm a, a person who answers a lot of questions on the web and in mailing lists, and I speak at conferences, and I'm an expert in many aspects of the IBM approach to computing. And I'm a MongoDB anti-patterns quiz maestro, which means that I can recognize bad code when I see it in MongoDB. <laughs> I'm not an employee representative of MongoDB. I am not representing IBM here, and I'm not representing Absolute Performance Incorporated. It's just Jack talking. I appreciate Go very much. I see it as sort of the C language redone in the light of half a century of experience. It's got an excellent design, a pleasant and clear syntax, a non-ideological object model. It just, you have the guts of the object and it's laying there on the table in front of you. You can, the structures, objects are structures with code wrapped around them. And that's what Go is. It's structures with code wrapped around them. There's no need to fancy it up with a lot of syntax. And they understood that after decades and decades of experience with the more theoretical object model languages. And I appreciate that very much as a veteran of them all. It has channels. I love channels. I, I, I sort of invented them myself in the 1990s in C++ uh, because it's such an obvious metaphor. Um, and I'm glad a language finally incorporates, incorporates them at the language level. It has a solid, efficient implementation. It has tightly integrated tooling and a delivery model. They learned from Java and from Smalltalk and from all these languages that come with their tooling and package delivery model, and they did it simpler than, than any other language I've seen. And I love simplicity. It's got a lively and engaged community. And that is so important because software that nobody's using is dead software. And uh, the community is very much on fire and very much engaged in the uh, onward development of the community. And that's so important. And it has an interesting heretical take on software engineering. I, I love the proverbs that, that, that have been uttered about Go, and I, I tend to, uh, to agree with them all. Okay, what's, what's MongoDB? Okay, I, I, I don't know how many people who are listening will have had any experience with MongoDB, so I'm going to try to introduce MongoDB and show how it's different from the SQL databasing metaphor that to this day dominates very, very much throughout the world dominates databasing. Okay, MongoDB is a database. It's sort of whether it, it was intended to or not, it's part of the no SQL movement. Though so that's, you know, that's just a label. Uh, the group of of people who felt that SQL and the structure of relational databasing was in some ways limiting. It's not a relational database management system, though it can cover the same turf. It is document centric is how they like to describe it. And we'll see what that means in a few more slides. It emerged, MongoDB emerged from the JavaScript and JSON community. Basically, though, you know, I'm not, I, I don't know if they like to, if the Mongo people, if the Mongo team likes to have it said this way, but really what it was is a bunch of JavaScript programmers going crazy and building themselves a database that was JSON. That, you know, Mongo, a Mongo document is JSON, basically, though it's not stored for efficiency reasons, it's not stored as pure JSON, though it may have been originally. Uh, the community edition, the community edition of MongoDB is open source. It is covered by a server side public license, which is somewhat controversial. 
in the enterprise community where I come from. I come from the you know IBM and stuff like that. The server side public license, what it really says is, okay, you could use the community edition for anything that you want, except if you set up a service and you offer MongoDB itself as a service, we own that. We have Atlas, they, it's called Atlas is their, is their cloud server. We own forever offering MongoDB as MongoDB to people who wanna rent MongoDB and use it themselves in the cloud. You can write any kind of application you want with the community edition and, and you can have as many users as you want and you don't owe us anything. But if you offer Mongo as a service itself, we own that and you gotta pay us. That's what the server side public license says more or less. My interpretation, again, I am not a lawyer. Uh, MongoDB has a lot of free tooling. Compass, which is kind of like if you use MySQL, PHP MyAdmin, it's the sort of MongoDB equivalent of a you know GUI GUI manager for you know for for, for MongoDB. Uh, Mongosh is the command line client, the Mongo shell, and it is basically a JavaScript interpreter with extensions for Mongosh for for MongoDB. They also have value added tooling. They have all kinds of you know programs and design tools and uh, layers, data abstraction layers that they have added. You can buy all the different tools. There's the Atlas Cloud provider with free dev accounts. You can play. You can be on Atlas forever, you know, and you can just fiddle with. You know, you can't really run a business from there, but you can certainly learn, and you do learn. And if you go through their free education program or their paid education program, you do all your work on Atlas. Uh, that's your provider. Uh, they have a community forum. They have education. As I said, a lot of it's free. You can go through a, a lot of uh, complete Mongo courses, video courses that take tests and everything um, uh, for, for free. And then they have a Mongo certification and that you pay for. Okay. And they have the MongoDB World Conference, uh, which is, you know, once a year event. And they go there and have a grand old time. And there's a lot more to the corporate side of MongoDB, but I'm not going to go there. I'm a technical guy. So I just kind of tried to give you the picture so you know what you're dealing with and how you get what you want. You know, you, you download the Mongo clients, you maybe download MongoDB and install it on your local machine or you use it in Atlas in the cloud. You use the forums and the education to figure out what you're doing and you're covered. You can always implement this at work because the community edition is open source or you can pay for tools and get the full license server edition, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so Pete DeJoy wrote a short history of MongoDB. And there's a lot of links in my presentation. I want you to know that the this is a, a Google slide presentation. At, and at the end, I will have QR codes on the screen and you can just snap them and you can grab the presentation and have all the links. Uh, and if you have any trouble with that, you can just you know talk to me on the Denver channel of, of, of the Gophers Slack, and I will uh, paste you the link. It's not password protected or anything particular. You can just uh, download this presentation. Okay, so MongoDB, said Pete DeJoy, well, he's quoting the founder, Elliot Horowitz, was born out of frustration using tabular databases, table databases, in large complex production deployments. We set out to build a database that we would want to use so that whenever developers wanted to build an application, they could focus on the application, not on working around the database. Those are noble words. The truth is, you know, Mongo presents its own complications <laughs> when you're designing an application. But if you, but, but if 20 years ago, you were a JavaScript programmer and you needed, you needed a JavaScript-like JSON like database database for putting on the back of your uh, of your web applications that looked really great. It was very you know it was quite quite easy to fall in love with it because it like a lot of things their 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 promise at first is we have no rules you can do anything you want and then gradually as it matures they realize well there's reasons that, that systems have rules and the rules are growing. Um, as Mongo grows, though you can always get around them still, but we do, have, but there are, if you want to have a sound design that can be maintained and brought forward into the future, 
there are a lot more rules than they envisioned at first when they wrote it. That's again, that's Jack talking because I'm, I'm not officially representing Mongo in any way. Okay, so uh, we, in the beginning, there were flat tables, you know, if we go back to relational database systems and they went, you know, a row went left to right and it, it was row after row after row in the table. And these tables were program defined. There was no like external data description of them. The program knew how many characters were in the name one field. These were rows of bytes and, and they were undifferentiated. You knew that the you know, name one took, had 18 characters in it, name two had 18 characters in it, middle initial had one character in it. And that's how databases work. If you wanted to add more data, add more columns. And because they were program defined, there was a tendency to not really want to keep adding more tables to your database. You tried to extend the tables you had as far as you could until the thing broke and then you broke it into more tables. Uh, keeping the retrieval logic as simple and rapid as possible because you were coding it all effectively by hand. And I'm talking about this is like the 1960s and early 1970s that databases worked this way. Uh, and during this time, you know, starting in the late 60s and through the 1970s and up to the 1980s, Christopher J. Date and his mentor, Edgar F. Codd, were working out the mathematical science of relational algebra and relational calculus. And some of you, if you have comp sci degrees, you maybe were forced to read at least a few chapters of an introduction to database systems by CJ Date. He's a very chatty writer. And it is very hard to get through that book because he talks so much in between the technical stuff, but it's a very thick book. Uh, but it is a wonderful book. And you understand relational databasing and where it came from very much if you get through Introduction to Database Systems by CJ Date. So by the 1980s, we had SQL and relational database management systems. You have a relation, a table. You have tuples, that's a row in a table. You have set operators and joins and things like that. You have a query engine, you have an optimizer, and you have a management tool set. And SQL is one of these relational database management systems. And RPG, which is kind of like the assembly code, for a database management system still exists in the in the main in, in in the IBM world and that's you can either just access the rows mechanically going row by row or you can use SQL and you can join tables and get result sets and that's how relational database management systems work and an awful lot of the science of it is figuring out how to break things apart into separate tables and how to join them when you need to do so Okay, so MongoDB from the NoSQL world takes a very different approach. The hierarchy there is database, excuse me, database collection. A database could have multiple collection. You have multiple databases. You know, you're, you've got a Mongo installation. You can have umpteen databases. Each database can have umpteen collections in it. And a collection is a collection of documents and the documents are generally alike, but they can be quite different from one another because you're not constrained to make them all the same like every row in a database table. It's kind of funny. Fields can be totally missing. A collection is a collection of documents and some of them may have a field that's called, you know, elephants and have data in the elephants field and some of them may be totally missing elephants and they instead might have a rabbits field. And you can do that. The documents do not have to be shaped the same way as they do in a tabular database. And you have a, the normal operations, they call them CRUD operations, you know, create, read, update, delete. Uh, they have find, insert, update, upsert, delete, aggregate, look up, project. They have all kinds of wonderful operators in MongoDB. And we'll look a little bit more at some of these as we proceed. But the takeaway from here is it's not tabular. It is not a collection of tables that have multiple rows and each row has the same number of columns. It's not like that at all. It's like a JSON document that you might send back and forth in a REST interface. Basically, a MongoDB collection is a collection of JSON documents and they don't have to be all shaped the same way. So my wife's a potter, and I wrote over the years, I wrote her website in 
PHP and MySQL, and I did not create a perfectly ideal, uh, fully normalized fourth normalization level, uh, you know, SQL database. I just kind of wrote it on the fly. And there's a pottery table with a number for the pot and the name and a description and a price, whether it's sold, whether it's on hold, notes about it. And it's got the, all the green arrows. This is uh, from PHP. My admin created this diagram for me. All the green arrows indicate one-to-one -one relationships. All these things, category, image, and PayPal really could have been in the pottery table. They are not, they, they are, they're not really, you know, but, but I broke them apart for various reasons, which are not important. And I made extra tables. And then these other ones, like there's tags, these, these are one to many relations. There could be many tags for one, uh, one pottery number. Uh, image detail, I have the image table. And what the image table really is, is the primary image for a piece of pottery. The image detail is extra images, and that's a one to many relationship. Uh, directory path is a list of directory paths that the images are stored in because I didn't stick the images in the database itself. So it has nowhere in the file system to find them. Uh, categories, cate uh, there are a couple of views. There's a view that uh, a pot can fall into, uh, a pot falls into one category in this design. And I have a view that gives you a categorized, a list of all the categorized pots and all the uncategorized pots. And then there's a table of exemplars. You, a pot can be an exemplar, a particular one. If you want to show one out of the, out of the category, like if you want to show one a glazed pot or one a functional piece of pottery or one non-glazed pot and you, you, there, there's a list of there's a table of exemplars that are examples of the particular kind of pot and uh then there was a table table of pots a view of non-exemplars just uh, another view and this is how i created the, this is most of the pottery database i created for my wife's website so I got the, the MongoDB bug a few years ago, and I said, okay, well, I'm going to redo this in Mongo because I've got to do some, a whole bunch of work on it. I really have to redo the website. So maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll switch it to Mongo. So I started doing it experimentally. And I just basically took the tables and made them Mongo collections, the, the, the database on MySQL, known as Her Wheel, became the database, the, the Mongo database, Her Wheel, and the, and the tables in it became collections in the new database. This was my first conceptual evolutionary step to port the pottery relational structure to MongoDB on a one-to-one -one table to document basis. Table, I just said table to collection basis. Okay. And it's got all these tables and they are effectively identical to the tables that I had written for my SQL. But the next step in the evolution highlights the advantage of documents versus relational tables in this use case, the use case for a website about my wife's pottery. Um, cross collection lookups and views based on them do exist in MongoDB. Here's some JavaScript. Uh, that creates a categorized view uh, corresponding to the categorized view found in the original MySQL version. Uh, uh, you do a create view, and the create view implies a lookup from, um, cat from category. Uh, the local field and the foreign field are the same. That's the remote keys. And I create a category array. And then I, uh, every time I touch my mouse, it jumps ahead. So it's good to look at this stuff in JavaScript because that's really the native language of Mongo and all the different drivers. You have to sort of see it this way in your head and then translate it into the language for this, the, the language specific driver. Okay, but this is a view and basically it states the cross table join and which fields from the cross table join are going to be delivered as documents when you 
access this view and you do a find in it. Okay. And basically it's going to come out as a view that has an ID that, that is not going to is not going to show its ID. Zero means don't, and then one means yes, inherit the field. And uh, it's going to have a pot number name, a description, a price, sold, hold, and the category, which is the zeroth element of the category element array and an exemplar, which is the zeroth entry of the category uh, exemplar array in the new design. That may sound a little obscure, but I think that if you've done joins to create views before in SQL, you will understand this. And if, if anybody has like, a, you know, if anybody's not really getting this and wants me to go back and explain a little better some of this, um, I'll be glad to do so, but I think probably at the end we'll have as much questions as you need. And I'd like to just say, okay, so the next. Oh, sorry, Jack. Uh, on that note, feel free to uh, submit any questions yes. in the chat, and I will uh, manage them as they come in. So, thank feel free, you. Feel free, everyone, to participate. Okay. Okay. So the first thing I did was I said, I'll. I'll just port table table to collection, table to collection, table to collection. Now I redesigned it and I realized I didn't need all these <laughs> didn't need all these tables. I just have a collection of documents and they really have everything in each document. Here's a pot number, here's a name, here's a description, here's a price, here's its precedence if it's shown with a lot of other things that are like it. Will this be the first or the last or have equal precedence, et cetera? Is it on hold? Is it sold? Any notes? Here's the PayPal, uh, you know, uh, uh, the PayPal uh, uh, HTML. Um, here's an array of images. Instead of having a primary uh, uh, image and a bunch of secondary images, I just throw them in an array in the document. And these are really the names of the images and their direct their directory path. And uh, I have a bunch of tags and they're all in an array inside the same document, a bunch of categories. I can have more than one. They're all in the same document. And this describes the entire pot. You know, so what was I doing with all this SQL tables? Well, you know, uh, I was doing it the way you do things in SQL and it was kind of a reflex. But an artwork can be described by what I call a prospectus. You know, the, it's like as if you got a certificate, you bought a precious work of art, and they give you a certificate telling you everything about it. That's really basically all I need for this website, you know, prospectus. And a MongoDB document naturally represents that. There's very little relational about this. Of course, there's arrays, but it's very easy to access array members in fields within a Mongo document. It's designed for that. It's designed to avoid relational queries. You just kind of go through it by hand with Mongo operators. It's kind of a step backwards from the beautiful, pure ideological model of SQL. Sound familiar? It goes kind of a step backwards from the beautiful, ideological, pure methodology of object-oriented languages. It's a similar kind of thing, if you see what I mean. It's like a, a, a similar kind of platonic ideal. So if we were selling hundreds of thousands of works by different artists and want to do data mining and business intelligence, we might want to use a relational database for tooling, efficiency, and clarity. But that's not my business case. So Mongo fits very nicely. And these design views here, they're coming from the Compass tool, which is like PHP, my admin for my SQL Compass, is, you know, the kind of design and browse through the database tool for MongoDB. And that's free. You can download it, you can build it, it's open source. Um, and, but again, you know, Mongo's promise was, oh, there's no rules, you can do anything you want, but you can add validation. And it's good to add validation, believe me, because otherwise you make mistakes. So I, I did add validation to the table. So if I try to throw something in that's wrong, I know immediately. And here is the compass view of my validation. Okay. Uh, I told you that, that a Mongo database is basically JSON in a box, you know, uh, a bunch of JSON documents, but they're stored in a form called BSON, which is a binary 
encoded form of JSON. So like there's a, so each of the properties has a BSON type, a, a binary uh, uh, object notation. And so the pot number is an int, its minimum is one, and it, description is an arbitrary number. Okay, the name is a BSON type string, name of pot, description, uh, is BSON type string description of pot. Price is a decimal. It's the dollar price of the pot, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Hold is a bool. Sold is a bool. Notes is a string. Uh, PayPal is a string. It's HTML text. It's just a string. Uh, images, et cetera. It's an array of uh, images, an array of object, and the object is your path of filing. Okay. So I did do validation for this and I created the validation. And here is part of the validation code again in Node.js that says create these tables with these properties. Here's the validation. And this stuff is, you know, pretty elementary. One of the lessons I learned about Mongo at the time when I did this was kind of interesting. I made a mistake when I wrote the validation and all my entries would fail validation. And I said, why? And I went to the Mongo logs and they said, validation failed. That was the helpful message they did, gave me. Well, since then they fixed that, but several of us, you know, hollered in the forums and said, what kind of a message is validation failed? Tell me what failed. I'd made it, I'd spelled something different, two different places. That was what it was, but Mongo couldn't tell me that at the time it wasn't in the log. So it's a constantly evolving system. They've gotten past that. There are other bumps they're going over. Okay, and here's a snippet from the Python code I wrote to translate from MySQL to MongoDB. And again, this was very easy to do in Python. And I used the Maria, um, MariaDB driver here, which works for legacy MySQL databases. Go is great for runtime programs, but generalized scripting and one-offs can be sometimes easier to get up and debug very quickly in this in an interpretive language. So I did this in Python. So uh, to, to close out our description of uh, the difference between SQL RDBMS and MongoDB, um, an SQL RDBMS is multi-relational table structure and you depend upon shared keys between multiple tables and each of the tables they have rows and the rows are the same the rows have the same structure to them all the way through the table whereas MongoDB is more like getting a prospectus about something they call it a document they could have called it a prospectus uh, SQL is a declarative language uh, that is you say what you want and you don't give the strategy for getting it. That's the SQL's query engine that does that. Mongo is largely procedural. It, uh, you know, uh, at the moment, uh, you basically say how you solve the problem step by step. It's, you know, declarative versus procedural is kind of like a theoretical argument. And it's like the yang and the yin. There are elements of proceduralism and declarative syntax. There's elements of declarative syntax and procedural. But I would say if there is a difference between the two, SQL is declarative and MongoDB is a procedural language. Uh, in SQL, an established relational design makes it easy to explore unanticipated data relationships. That's one of the advantages of um, SQL is if you... There's design patterns that are very, very well known and have decades and decades, almost half a century of experience behind them. And if you follow them, even if you don't know why you're following them, when you go to come up, when suddenly you're doing data mining and trying to come up with queries, all of a sudden, you know, it, it, it becomes fairly straightforward to make the kind of query you're looking for in SQL because you designed your database according to design patterns that have been proven over half a century of experience with SQL. Uh, MongoDB, if you, you know, you could, you, could, you could say, I'm free, and you can design your document collection any way you want it, but then you might find it's a little hard to mix apples and oranges when you go to do some query that you didn't think of when you were creating it. The design patterns are still evolving. I'm not saying there's anything structurally inferior 
about MongoDB. I'm just saying that SQL is more mature and what the outcome of certain kinds of decisions you make is better known and better understood than it is in something like MongoDB. My, in SQL, you spend more thought at design time. MongoDB, you don't have to think at all. You can just write a document, say, okay, I'm gonna put this, this, and this in here. And the next document in the collection, document number one goes like this, document number two is totally different. I don't care. I'll look them up if I want to know what they are, et cetera. I can always look at them in Compass. If I forget how I designed, I can just bring Compass up and I can look and say, what did I do in document number two that's different from document one? You know, people solve problems this way in Mongo sometimes. It's, it's, an, it's, it's an anti pattern, really. But they'll, you know, the community is maturing out of that and they are becoming more regular and more familiar with what their sound design patterns are. And there's a lot of thought about this at the time. Uh, SQL, RDB, you have a wide assortment of tooling. You're never single sourced. MongoDB, narrower, narrower range of tooling. There you go. It's a, it's, a, it's a minority approach still. You have immense community and experience with SQL. You have a small but growing community of very enthusiastic uh, MongoDB programmers. Uh, SQL is mature and MongoDB is maturing. Oh, and by the way, in case somebody thinks the SQL is totally out, there is a Mongo, Mongo SQL daemon that accepts incoming requests from an SQL client and proxies those requests to the Mongo daemon and stuff. And that has its own kinks. And that's sort of like, uh, you know, learning to write uh, Chinese with Japanese characters. You know what I mean? It's, it's a funny little translation issue of, of SQL. So it can be very complex in itself using SQL with Mongo, but it does work. Go, we're back to Go. Finally, after all that talk about Mongo, which, uh, Go, Mo, they have a tremendous, they're very language aware at Mongo and they have drivers for all these languages that you see here. And, um, you know, of course the, you know, the Node.js one is kind of like the oldest, I think it's probably the oldest one. And uh, PHP is very, the PHP driver is very heavily used and there's a large group for that. There's a smaller group for the C and C++ drivers, and there's a growing group for the .NET, not .NET people in C Sharp, Rust and Scala and Swift. Well, you know how many Rust and Scala and Swift programmers there are in the world, so you can figure out what's going on there. And there is the Go driver, and they it seems to be, this is my interpretation, it seems to be very strategic for Mongo. It seems like they very much are interested in the Go community and in microservices being coded in Go against a MongoDB um, database. So they're working on that very hard is my impression. Um, here is the MongoDB homepage. As I said, all these links, you'll be able to download this document. I'll have a QR code up on the screen. You can snap it with your phone or you can just ask and, 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 and our host will have um, the, uh, uh, Brendan will have the URL for uh, this presentation, the MongoDB on GitHub. As I said, the community edition is open source, the MongoDB manual, the MongoDB driver page, the MongoDB Go driver, again, open source on GitHub, and the MongoD, MongoDB Go driver API docs. And if you go through uh, the MongoDB driver page, it'll give you detailed instructions on installing the Go driver. So it's not it's not a it's not a it's not a big challenge. It's not uh, it's not uh, that you're putting it together out of popsicle sticks. This is this part of the MongoDB approach is pretty mature. Installing the drivers, it's not very difficult. So here's a simple Go program: connect and list all the databases on connect and list all the databases on the cluster. And so the way I wrote this first one, I, I wrote it where it requires a MongoDB URL. Uh, and uh, we'll discuss MongoDB URLs in a moment. Uh, so if the args are wrong, exit. Uh, instance a new client and apply the URI to the client. Uh, connect, uh, uh, Context, I create a context with timeout and then do the connect so that if it takes more than 10 seconds, it goes fatal. Uh, then I, you, I call list database names um, and, and a uh, 
with a context, with the same context, uh, a timeout context, and a Bison structure for um, receiving the uh, database names. And then um, I print the databases and disconnect. And here's a run of it over on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, I, I ran a little script that has my Mongo URI because the, the passwords include, include, included in the URI. That's one way to do it. Um, and so the DB name is, uh, the DB names that are being shown are from the JWAR database and the sample. Oh, these are all, these are names of all the databases. There's a JWAR database, a sample Airbnb, and these are all samples that are given to you in that list and it just listed all the databases. Very exciting, I'm sure, but you see how it's simple to connect and it's simple to get access to the databases. And that's the point here. There's a BSON driver and that's again for this, there's a, there are specific structures to handle this binary coded object notation that is JSON turned into a binary protocol. And then there's the Mongo driver and the Mongo options driver. And there's nothing called read preferences. And I didn't use that. I commented that out. It's not actually used. But when you have a, 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 a cluster, uh, you know, you have a secondary and stuff and you say, do I want to read, you, you know, there's read and write preferences. Do I want my write call to return before the secondary says that, that I've been written to, or do you want to return? You want to wait until the secondary acknowledges the right. And there's all kinds of preferences like that because they very much have scalability in mind. Mongo is very scalable. So, okay, so a MongoDB URI is a URI encoded resource identifier. Here's a typical. Here's here's a typical one. This is all faked out, but. Basically, this is my this is a, 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 a satire of my Mongo uh, Atlas cluster, the Atlas in the cloud. There are several schemes, with or without the username, with or without the password inside the host portion of the of the URI. The default DB can be in path my first database. In the case of the example, there are many options to control commit strategy in a query in the query string. The you know a question mark. Uh, uh, read preferences equals so-and-so. And some elements with some tools can be dash dash options when you are invoking a tool to access, like Mongosh to access the database and you're passing it a URL on the command line. You can, some of the things that you might include in the URI, encode in the URI could be instead options to the command when you're using Mongo tools. But in a program, you typically use a full Mongo URI that has everything in it you want to control your connection to it. Okay, here's a query designed for the sample data set provided by MongoDB in your free Atlas account. And this is taken, this is, this is my take from the Go Quick Start page. And um, you connect to the URI, uh, you have a deferred function to disconnect. Um, you go to the sample mflix, which is a satire of Mongo, satire of Netflix. They have a database that is as if they were running a video service. And they do the collection movies and they, the title is Back to the Future. And they find one with that title. They find one document with that title if they can find it. And otherwise, they, um, if no documents are returned, error, no documents, printf, no document was found with the title so-and-so. Okay, et cetera. And then they print the JSON data. And here's the next screen is a run of this. And this is what you get because there is, Back to the Future is one of the movies in the database, the sample database that they give you in Atlas when you're learning how to use Mongo. And here it is, the document came back. It's, I, it's got an arbitrary ID that was created. If you don't create an underscore ID yourself, Mongo will give it one, has to be unique. Um, it got these awards, and and it, this is the cast, and the cast is an array. Uh, the countries it was shown in is an array. The countries it was uh, made in is an array, but that's just one country in that array. The directors, that's an array. 
Full plot is a text field. The genres it falls into is an array. These are all subfields of this one document. This is not a join. This is just what they write code into the document. Anyway, to get more personal, here is my her wheel pottery database in Mongo. And here is a, I, I'm in the Mongosh shell here. This is an actual session. And I am interpretively writing an aggregation query that says that um, I would like, what I'm really trying to get is I want an array to return of all the first entries in the image array for every pot in the system. And I want to know the file name and I want to know the, dir path, the directory path it's found in. So I'm just going to go through and list all the image, all the first images. Remember, each pot may be associated with a, a, a array of different images of the same pot. And I'm just going to get back the first one. And I do this actually in the code because I have a slideshow while you're picking pottery. There's a slideshow going on that's changing every few seconds and it's showing you the pretty pottery going by, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so I use the aggregation operator. The DB I have chose, I, I did use in the interpretive shell Mangash, I did use her wheel three, that's the database. And that's the database being used. So DB dot pottery means the pottery collection inside whatever's the current DB. And then aggregate is the operator. And here are the arguments. The arguments are an array. And the array consists of the aggregation steps. And I project means what fields will be returned at this point in the aggregation pipeline for every document in the collection. I don't want the ID. I do want the pot number. I do want the first image, the array element at zero, the first image field, the array element zero for images. And I want to sort them by pot number. And I want to set dir path to the first image dot dir path because each of these entries in the images array consists of a dir path and a file name. So I want to set an arbitrary variable dir path to the first image dot dir path and an arbitrary variable file name to the first image dot file name field in each of these zeroth array entries that are returned to me one for every pot in the collection. And then at the end, I want to project dir path and file name and that's all I want. And that's what I get. I get an array consisting of documents they're documents, they're inside the curly braces. Each of these is a document in itself. Everything is a document. That which you are querying is a document. That which is returned is a document. And I get all these things. And again, this is the Mangash shell. And it shows me, there's a lot more pottery than that, but when you're doing it interpretively, it shows you yay so many, and that's configurable by your configuration file. And then it says type IT, iterate for more and it would show you another page of them if you typed it. So I showed you this all in JavaScript to show it to you in its native language. But now here's the same code in Go. Here's the same code that I just showed you to get me. Again, the dir path and the file name for every first image for every pot in the, in the, in the collection. Okay, so I, I haven't shown the connection logic of connecting to the database, but the collection, the client is already connected. And the client.database, the collection is client.database for wheel three collection pottery. Okay, so now I've got a collection, C O L L. And then the pipeline consists of this text. Okay, well, it's, it, I mean, it's a Mongo pipeline is sort of text in JavaScript, but it's a pipeline structure in the go mongo driver and i instance this interface with this data notice i'm using bson d structures and stuff uh, as part of the instancing and then i get a cursor and i say collection dot aggregate 
context to do, and then I pass it my pipeline. Okay, and I get a res I get a result array. I, I create a, I create an array for results, and then I um, pass it to the cursor to get all, and then I loop through the results and I print the dir path and the file name. So that's that same code you saw on the previous slide in JavaScript translated into Go, our favorite language. For more information on bison.d, bison.m, there's a nice link to working with bison and Go, and they explain that to you, what you have to do to work with, uh, with the binary form of JSON inside the Go driver, where it's just sort of behind the scenes in the JavaScript code, you have to actually interface with it in Go. Okay, MongoDB's drivers sometimes feel like an R&D project, you know, like we just discovered a bug last week. Unmarshalling BSON into a struct with interface fields containing concrete value types doesn't work as expected. It turned out that if you were doing it with JSON, it worked, but if you're doing it with BSON, it didn't work. Okay, so there was a bug, but they're working on it. They're just, they're just churning away at it. So a few final thoughts about Mongo. Take the free online courses and take them in order. And the secret to everything in Mongo is the aggregate operator. Everything you do beyond a simple find, you know, which is kind of like SQL looking for a lost document, you know, find. You, you, everything turns into an aggregation pipeline. The aggregate is the secret of life, the universe, and everything in MongoDB. Install MongoDB 5 on your workstation and learn to configure it at the small level, you don't have to do everything. You don't have to set up replication servers and stuff like that. Use your free limited Atlas development account to model deployment in the large. If you're really thinking of using it in your business, you might use that free Atlas development account to sort of model how you would do it and learn a little bit more about Mongo deployment. Though so there's wonderful courses about this and they really do have very good video courses. Um, they're closed captioned. The closed captions are often hysterically wrong, by the way. <laughs> You'll get a lot of entertainment by the mist. There's a couple of fellows like with Australian accents and, and it just defeats the closed captioning system. It's all automated. Um, learn uh, Compass and learn Mongosh. So those are the two main tools that you need to use from the tool set, Compass and Mongosh. The forms are very good. The interface to the forms is kind of complicated. Mongo seems to have you know, a lot of their exercises are designed in, in the lessons and their education is here. We have a website that we're designing in, in, in whatever language and, and here's how you do Mongo with it. And they seem to have a philosophy about um, web interface design and it permeates their own forms. And so it's kind of, they kind of have their own view of these things. The docs are good, but they're rigorous. They're very hard. They say things once, and if you missed it, you're lost. I spend a lot of time searching the web, and you got to be sure your answers are pretty recent because Mongo's are cha Mongo is changing very fast. A six-year-old answer may not be useful. Uh, the docs, like I said, they're very good and they're very they're very well written, but at the same time, they're not. Re they're like sort of like if you know how this works already, you can find everything you want in the docs. <laughs> but how do you get started? Well, take our courses. Okay, yeah. So do, you'll do a lot of web searching if you're working with Mongo. And MongoDB development priorities seem to me, and that's my impression, they seem to follow community interests. So the more Go programmers that show up in their forums and ask more questions, all of a sudden a little more, little more effort is put into the Go, um, the Go side of things. And one last thought about Go plus MongoDB, JavaScript and JSON is the implementation language that inspired it. And it's, it's the most concise abstract description of what's going on in Mongo. When you program Mongo in Java, Python, Node, PHP, Go, C, in every case, the Mongo operations are translations from the native JS syntax. It's tricky, but it expands your insight into the nature of programming language. So it's JavaScript, in many ways is a fragile, flimsy language, but it is a very clear functional notation for MongoDB and the translation from that notation to Go is not a huge leap once you understand the BSON 
structures. That's basically, that's the big, that was the biggest hurdle for me was the BSON structures because you don't have to deal with that. Usually I'd done some, I did some BSON programming in, in PHP, but, uh, but it's kind of tricky in at first. And thank you for attending. This is the URL for my presentation, or you can just hold your phone up to the screen right now and you can snap those QR codes and it'll take you right to this presentation and you're welcome to, to download it and use it. So just don't put any words in my mouth that I didn't say. I may have said too much already. So that is my presentation. Can I answer anyone's questions or is there any discussion or do you want to discuss something totally different? Well, Jack, I'd just like to first say uh, thank you so much for this presentation. This was extremely educational for me. Um, I'd like to also say thank you for the um, uh, the bit of bit of the history about the difference between relational database database systems and then you know these these non-relational systems. Uh, so this is super cool, uh, and it's also interesting to hear about the Go community or the Go driver being um, perhaps prioritized in the in the MongoDB community. Uh, maybe, so I have a few questions myself uh, and uh, I'll just maybe ask this one to start. Uh, is there anything that you know of that might explain why the, the Go um, driver is being prioritized? Do, do, do you think maybe they, they see just a lot of volume or is there anything about the Go language that maybe marries nicely with MongoDB. One thing I noticed is like Go structures are very JSON syn syntax s similar, um, <clears throat> similar to JSON syntax. And, you know, uh, JSON marshalling and unmarshalling is built in to Go. So maybe that marries nicely with, with the driver or not. But I was curious to know if you had any uh, thoughts on that. On that. I have some thoughts and I have some abstract theories about that. Um, I, and again, I, this is my interpretation of why a large corporation takes different development directions. And I am privy to no special information. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. But I think that one of the biggest concerns when they want to promote, they're, they're working, I know that they're working very hard to promote the idea that MongoDB is sliced bread. You can use it anywhere. You can use it in the enterprise. You can use it on your mama's website. You know, it's just, it's for everything, everything that, and you don't need SQL. You can, you know, put Mongo everywhere. And one of the issues when you come up with a new system is that the, you know, performance tuning of, um, a new system that's, you know, you spend a decade, two decades tuning the performance of your system and finding new tricks to make it run faster. And what everybody knows who's used Go is that anything you do in Go, it runs very, very fast. It runs fast compared to PHP. It's going to run fast compared to JavaScript. It's going to run quite fast. And I think that Go encourages them uh, to make this presentation that go that MongoDB can be used everywhere because the performance they get out of the Go driver is very good. So I think it's partly that, and I think partly, as with any corporation, I suspect they have a couple of large clients who are using Go, and I do not know that, but I, you know, I've been in this business a long time. My antennas are wiggling. My spider sense is tingling. They've got a few customers that are saying, come on, work on the Go driver. Work on the Go driver. I want faster, faster, more and more. So, I mean, that, I think... that does check out to me. Um, what's, what's nice is that often we can see the Go community growing um, and therefore more interest in the language and then more participation in open source tooling and things like that. So, um, I, I'm not getting any questions in the chat, or if, if anybody does want to ask a question directly through the um, through through uh, voice chat, feel free to either raise your hand or and jump in. But I do have a few questions myself, so 
Um, it seems like you, you mentioned this also uh, yourself. Uh, MongoDB is trying to sort of promote themselves as like a, a replacement for all things. Um, so do you see like MongoDB or no relational databases replacing relational databases? Uh, one thing I use is quite often is Postgres and I see Postgres adopting no relate um, non-relational concepts as well, like involving document structures and things like that. So um, I know you did give a slide on the pros and cons of, of between the two, but um, just, you know, speculating, uh, could this be a, a replacement for our future data stores for our applications? I think for some kinds of applications, uh, let, let me first say, you know, I work in the enterprise world. Enterprise is code for, you know, like, you know, banks, financial, you know, insurance companies, uh, uh, big manufacturing interests and stuff like that. Uh, I see no big movement there to say, let's redesign the stuff that we wrote over a period of 50 years. Let's just stop everything and redesign this. That's exactly what the enterprise does not do. And that's why, you know, the, you know, the old buffalo hunter who had to retire because he ran out of old buffaloes to hunt. I'm an old programmer and I program, I write, I, I maintain old programs. <laughs> you know, that's kind, of, that's kind of what I do for a living. And there's not like a lot of it, uh, you know, if there's an impetus, they, they go, if there's anything they want to do, sometimes they get off the, the legacy systems and they go to like, you know, MSSQL and that's a big jump for them or something like that. Or they might go to Postgres. They do go to Postgres. I see that a lot. And, uh, but they, but the beauty of that is they don't totally have to redesign their relational structure to do that. Whereas they have to, you know, find a bunch of young people who are excited about this and think about redoing everything in MongoDB and then they do it in MongoDB and they say, isn't it beautiful? And they say, yeah, but it's got these bugs. Well, we'll fix them soon. Yeah, but soon is now, you know, in the enterprise, it has to work today. So no, I don't see this replacing RDBMS as furthermore, RDBMSs are ex so finely tooled and so finely machined like DB, th there's nothing in the world like DB2. I mean, Oracle isn't like DB2, you know, DB2 and Oracle and MSSQL rule the world. Uh, they, they run, they run American, they run the American enterprise, you know, and they're not going away in your lifetime, you know, it's just, it's not going to happen. Um, but there's a lot of things that if you're designing them now, a lot of service offerings, if you're designing them now, certainly parts of it, um, certainly parts of it, at least, uh, can be decided in Mongo. Uh, 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 we've used Mongo where I work at, at you know, at, uh, we, uh, IBM has explored Mongo because, you know, you're writing a website and yet, you know, what's a user? A user is another a document. A user is a document in a web system. You know, they're, 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 they're their name, their password, their, you know, stuff about them, their badges as an array in a subfield, you know, a user in a website is a document. There's no point in going through a whole SQL design session for this. And furthermore, what, you know, the Mongo selling point, the original Mongo selling point, which they're kind, which they're kind of, they still say it, but they don't necessarily mean it. You know, oh, you don't have to do any design. You just throw together a document. This is true about a lot of websites. I mean, Discord may be based on Mongo. Who knows? You know, I don't know if it is or it isn't. But, you know, your Discord user database could be MongoDB, and there'd be no reason for it not to be. Uh, you know, so anything like that that just suddenly springs up overnight, throw it into Mongo. Why not? And, and if you get the performance you want, if you write your microservices in Go, you know, you're, you're home. Yeah, one of one of the things that is, is appealing to me is the sort of um, the non uh, the 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 uh, the loose structure of the of the document. And you mentioned it that you don't need to have these fields, or um, you know, a document can just be a document, whether fields are populated or not. Um, and and also an interesting thing and something that I'm not familiar with with. Inter interfacing with relational databases is the sort of like three three dimensional structure of all of this, where um, you're 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 deviating from the tabular 
X, Y column sort of thing and, and, and adopting a tree structure there. So, um, <clears throat> and again, in line with what you were saying, just, I don't want to miss this point, validation, anybody mm -hmm. who, anybody writes a serious MongoDB who doesn't add validation for every field is out of their mind. You know what I mean? <laughs> so all this, all this, oh, you could just decide it anyway and everything could be different. Well, you know, there's a statement whether these fields are required or not. You know, you can have optional fields so that you don't have to have empty fields with nulls in them. But if the field you have to declare, if the field is optional or not, and if the field is, and if the field is present, you know, what is its nature? What does it have to be? And there's all kinds of validation rules you can apply to it. So, you know, it, it's loosey goosey at first, but they, but everybody who's really using it is tightening up their belts. You know, they're they're making sure that they, so, so it's moving more towards be, you know, and that that leads to reliability. That's why these things exist. That's why uh, data type checking. That's why not null is there in SQL. There should never be nulls in a database in SQL. That's what CJ, that's CJ Date's great rant. He's in his 80s. He still rants about that. Not, there should never be a null in a database. That's ridiculous. You know, the default values maybe, but not null. There should be, everything should be not null. And so, you know, so all these things that tighten up a database, make its performance reliable, make sure that surprises don't happen while you're trying to move millions of dollars from point A to point B. All these things are appearing in MongoDB, and not just appearing, they've been there for a while, but people are starting to use them because as they actually use it, they discover, well, freedom comes at a cost. And, you know, and the cost eventually is that you have to put back in a lot of the stuff that you were laughing at that was there in the relational databases. Yeah, um, on, that, on that note, um, there's one book that I would like to plug right now, and I'll, um, I'll get a link to it. Uh, so that it's in the recording here, but it's called Designing Data Intensive Applications. Data Intensive Applications. And of course, it is a uh, O'Reilly book. So um, we all know and trust that uh, publication. Um, but uh, something that goes into discussion about, you know, deciding whether you want a relational database or a, a, a um, no SQL database, it, it goes into the considerations here about all this. And it actually has a fun little anecdote about uh, the null type and how that also has like thrown a wrench into programming uh, for, for forevermore. Um, so I'll just drop this in the chat here if anyone wants to go check it out. Um, <clears throat> I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm just gonna assume that there are none at this point. Um, and so at this point, Jack, I'd like to just say, you know, from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for this, for this presentation. This was excellent. And uh, I've learned quite a lot. And um, this is exactly kind of what I was looking for to get a dip my toes into the, the Mongo, the realm of MongoDB. And um, it's been, it's been awesome to learn about this. So thank you, Jack. Uh, round of applause. And, and um, yeah, hopefully we can all link up in person at some point uh, during our in-person meetups, of course. Um, I'm gonna stop the recording now and we'll just kind of go off script. So uh, here we are.